call a good afternoon, everybody. I hope you stayed up late reading your reading your handbook. Uh, today we're going to discuss. But then I'm going to say this, you know, like every day, my favourite book from the series, because as soon as I start to reread them, they become the favourite for that day, at least. But uh, really, The Road, if you haven't read it already, is really a phenomenal, phenomenally powerful book. And represents one of the most complete and vivid descriptions of what I've been calling the catastrophic world, which, you know, all the different texts present in, in different sorts of ways. Uh, a world of extreme conditions. And the title of this lecture is uh, a very famous phrase from Thomas Hobbes, nasty, brutish, and short, not referring to me, you know, <laughs> referring to life in Hobbes's Leviathan, life in the state of nature. And we'll see that in a few moments as we return to a quite lengthy quotation from Hobbes that I showed you at the beginning, that it's almost as if the road is based on demonstrating certain key aspects of Hobbes's description. And that we'll see uh, in a moment or two. Uh, the Road is a, is a great novel. It, it was also made into quite a good film, quite a powerful film, uh, which I suggest you might also like to see. Uh, whether you read the novel or not, it, it can stand independently. And we saw a little bit of that in the first lecture that I gave you a little extract from that. <coughs> So you remember the starting point of the lecture series, uh, that many of these post-apocalyptic narratives or narratives set on a desert planet like Arrakis or Dune, they kind of imagine humans returning to a state of nature. And in doing this, they put into play the extremes, the extreme ends of the spectrum of political thinking of two views regarding how societies hold or don't hold together through fear or through the bonds of sociability. And the two thinkers, early modern thinkers, who can be usefully used to represent the extreme ends of these spectrums are Thomas Hobbes and Adam Smith. The thing I want to do today is to show you some of the complexities of McCarthy's thinking and suggest that while he holds or thinks he holds one view, there's something else going on in his thinking, which he, he's not, it's almost that he's not quite aware of that. And then I'll talk a little bit about how that's the case with reference to some of his thoughts on language in the unconscious at the end of the lecture. Because in a straightforward sort of way, McCarthy does seem to hold a Hobbesian-like view of the necessity and the no escape from violence. He insists there's no such thing as life without bloodshed. I think the notion that the species can be improved in some way, that everyone could live in harmony, 
is a really dangerous idea. Those who are afflicted with this notion are the first ones to give up their soul to their freedom. Your desire that it be that way will enslave you and make your life vacuous. So he's someone who really thinks that violence is kind of intrinsic to humans and there isn't a sweet Adam Smith-like view present, apparently, in his thinking. And I'll mention a number of his books for those of you who are looking to expand your reading and put your reading list together and so on. But one of the most powerful is reckoned to be a book called Blood Meridian, one of the most violent books uh, that exists, probably. Uh, and Harold Bloom, I mention him partly because he, he died quite recently, so he was a tribute to that thinker, American literary critic Harold Bloom, on Blood Meridian, described it once again in kind of Hobbesian terms. The violence, he writes, or said, is the book. The judge, who is a character in Blood Meridian, the judge is the book, and the judge is, short of Moby Dick, Melville's novel, the most monstrous apparition in all of American literature. And when someone like Bloom says that, it means quite a lot, as Bloom was one of the greatest critics of American literature and really knew it inside out whether you agree with all his judgments or not. The judge is violence incarnate. The judge stands for, and then I've just highlighted that phrase, this, this is a sort of Hobbesian element we're beginning with. The judge stands for incessant warfare for its own sake. So it sees society as incessant warfare, very Hobbes-like. Uh, <coughs> McCarthy was born in 1933, he's been married three or four times, at least one child, he's written about uh, ten books, a few screenplays, some short stories, and uh, the ones that are the most well-known or famous, uh, Blood Meridian, the one I, I just mentioned, a series known as the Border Trilogy, uh, which feature all the pretty horses, which was made into a film, The Crossing and Cities of the Play, together they form the Border Trilogy, set at the end of the Wild West and the opening of the 20th century. Another powerful book which began its life actually as a screenplay, No Country for Old Men, which was made into a pretty successful Coen Brothers film, which you could also see. And of course, The Road, which we're talking to, talking about today. And again, you can see this thing about what makes text canonical in this translation and crossover sort of thing, where a number of these fictions have attracted <coughs> interest of filmmakers and have gone into film production. McCarthy was born into a relatively well-off family but broke with them quite early and became a kind of a vagabond who was determined to become a writer. And again, it's that same obsessiveness that links you know, the different writers we've been talking about. An, an intensity, uh, an independence, a commitment to writing, even when it wasn't bringing in any money. Uh, I knew I could write, I just had to figure out how to eat while doing this. Like Frank Herbert, like Philip K. Dick, like many writers, somebody who's possessed by the desire to write. And this is one of the reasons for uh, his multiple marriages, as he often expected his wives to carry the financial burden of supporting him while he wrote, and 
you know, they got a bit fed up with that. I'm sure there are many other dimensions. We lived in total poverty, so it's his second wife, British pop singer that he met on a cruise, uh, Annie DeLille. For nearly eight years, they lived in a dairy barn outside of Knoxville. We used to wash in the lake. We were bathing in the lake, you know, running water. Someone would call up and offer him $2,000 to come and speak at a university. I have to say, this is not what I'm getting paid. <laughs> come and speak at a university about his books. And he would tell them that everything he had to say was there on the page. So we would continue eating beans for another week. So, you know, a real almost Flaubertian dedication to, to writing. And um, it's that sort of intensity and dedication which, which makes for interesting books as people pour their life's energies into them. And so they're going to be uh, kind of complex. I like your chance of being complex. Now, just to remind you uh, of the beginning, I'm suggesting that in an interesting way, there's a very powerful strain of Hobbes and Hobbesian violence and fear at work in McCarthy's writing as a whole, and particularly in the road. And it's so interesting as you're reading through Leviathan, as people do from time to time, that uh, you come across a passage which, as I said, it's almost like a road map to the road. It describes a great deal of, of what is going on in the plot of the road, where every man is enemy to every man. In the road, the main character whose name was traveling with his son avoids other people as much as possible. He's well aware of this Hobbesian precept that every man is enemy to every man. And the road literalizes that idea. Some are cannibals, some are just violent. It's, it's, it's every man is enemy to every man. And Hobbes' concern, writing in the 17th century, is that in such a condition, society cannot improve. And particularly in this period, as, as uh, capitalism is developing, and the economy is becoming more important, he says, well, the real problem is there's no place for industry. Industry at this point not meaning heavy industry, but simply meaning work and the division of labor and the social arrangements necessary to provide for labor. And that's because you don't, you, if people can't cooperate, then you can't have industry. You can't be certain that you'll get a return on your investment and whatever. And consequently, there's no culture of the earth. Culture here, in its primitive sense, or basic sense, of growing crops for agriculture to feed, to sell, etc., etc. There's no culture of the earth, there's no navigation, which is a broad term for communications, uh, for taking material goods from one place to another, across the sea but also in land, no use of commodities that may be imported by us. See, no commodious building, no knowledge of the face of the earth, no account of time, no art, no letters, no society. Which is, worst of all, continual fear and danger of violent death. And the life of man, solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. It absolutely describes the catastrophic world of the world. Because there's none of those things, all there is is fear. So it's an absolutely, I mean, for anyone who reads the book or hasn't, it's an absolutely devastating book to read, extremely powerful. 
And just an example of this catastrophic world, almost chosen at random from the book. On the far side of the river valley, the road passed through a stark black burn. Charred and limbless trunks of trees stretched away on every side. It's never made entirely clear what has happened. But it looks like there's been a kind of global atomic war or accident of some kind, which has released uh, a lot of ash into the atmosphere as everything has been burned, like Australia magnified. And consequently, it seems that nature has died. All the fish in the sea, everything is dead. And people are wandering around pushing supermarket trolleys, trying to find the last tins of canned food. And in a, a curious moment, they find, the boy and his father find what may be the very last tin of Coca-Cola, which the boy drinks with great pleasure, saying, it fizzes. It's, it's, uh, it's Charred and limbless trunks of trees stretched on every side ash moving over the road, and the sagging hands of blind wire strung along the blackened light poles, whining thinly in the wind. A burned house in a clearing, and beyond that a reach of meadowlands, stark and gray, and a raw red mud bank where a road works lay abandoned. Farther along were billboards advertising motels, everything as it had been, save faded and weathered. The top of the hill, they stood in the cold and wind, getting their breath. He looked at the boy. I'm all right, the boy said. The man put his hand on his shoulder and nodded towards the open country below them. Nothing to see. No smoke. Can I see, the boy said. Yes, of course you can. They leaned on the cart and adjusted the wheel. What do you see? The man said. Nothing. He lowered the glasses. It's raining. Yes, the man said. I know. So it's just this absolutely catastrophic landscape, devoid of life, with some buildings still standing as poignant reminders of a world that once was, but that world has gone. And there are other isolated figures or some bands of people wandering around, desperately trying to find stuff to eat, and many groups turning to cannibalism to, to keep going. Every man afraid of every man too dangerous to be in touch with other people. It's a very detailed description of an end of the world, a catastrophic end of the world. And you'll see that if you think of writing as a kind of painting, the very restricted palette which uh, McCarthy uses to describe this catastrophic world, its blacks, its charcoals, its greys, it's raining almost all the time. It's, it's a dreary, dread, dreadful, dreadful world. And this goes on for page after page. Now, what I want to draw your attention to is a, is a very, for me, at least very interesting feature of this text and of McCarthy's thinking. It's that in this novel and in this world, a part of that muted palette of colors comes in the way in which everything is focused now on simply use. And language 
itself is becoming muted and toned down. Let me try and show you. An hour later, they were on the road. He pushed the cart, and both he and the boy carried knapsacks. In the knapsacks were essential things. That's very important. They could only carry essential things. All aesthetic things, etc., have gone. Everything is focused down onto survival. In case, in the knapsacks were sent, in case they had to abandon the cart and make a run for it if they see other people. A threat. Clamped to the handle of the cart was a chrome motorcycle mirror that he used to watch the road behind them. And here you have this powerful realism at work in MacArthur's writing, where you don't get, as in kind of lazy non-writers, just something like they had a motorcycle mirror they used to watch behind them. You get a recursively detailed picture of, of what's actually there, not just a mirror, but a motorcycle mirror, not just a motorcycle mirror, but a chrome motorcycle mirror, not just on the cart, but on the handle of the cart, and not just on the handle of the cart, but clamped on the handle of the cart. So everything is absolutely pinned down in a useful and instrumental way, which mirrors the useful and instrumental way they have to live in this catastrophic world. The road was empty. Below, in the little valley, the still gray serpentine of a river, motionless and precise. Along the shore, a burden of dead reeds. Again, see how what was once alive, the serpentine of a river, is now motionless and then that interesting word, precise, because the life has gone. Everything is instrumentalized, in a sense. Along the shore, there are dead reeds, but an interesting way of putting that, a burden of dead reeds, that they have no purpose anymore. Are you OK, he said. The boy nodded. They set out along the blacktop in the gun metal blacktop of the road in the gun metal light, shuffling through the ash, each the other's world entire. <coughs> now I'm going to come back to that last phrase, each the other's world entire, because that performs or begins to perform some of the shift from the purely Hobbesian view of fear as dominant to something else in the book which actually makes it possible to read because it's an excruciating book to read and yet you can read it. And the reason for this is because there's something else there other than simply violence and fear, but actually goes a little bit against what we saw as McCarthy's own views as violence and fear being central to society. So what I'm trying to suggest is that even while McCarthy is almost consciously channeling Hobbes, there's something else going on, which are, not surprisingly, the ones that are really, some Smithian elements. Let me try and let's show you how, how that works, how it comes about. First, just um, you know, a little bit of repetition and deeping of, of, of this. Everything is reduced to use in this catastrophic and ashen world. 
they rummage through the outbuildings for anything of use. He found a wheelbarrow and pulled it out and tipped it over and turned the wheel slowly, examining the tire. Now what I want to say is that this passage in particular, but the other passages we've discussed, they embody one particular Hobbesian dimension of language, which is language simply is an instrument for the correct scientific naming of the world. And you'll see, there's a, like I mentioned before, a very precise, useful realism to the language. McCarthy is a master of realism, where he found a wheelbarrow, and then he doesn't just turn it over. He pulled it out, he tipped it over, he turned the wheel slowly, examining the tire. You're given a really, really detailed picture, realistic picture of the scene. Similarly, the rubber of the tire, the wheel, was glazed and cracked. It's, it's the additive detail which creates the really strong, close-up, realist detail. But he thought it might hold air, and he looked through old boxes and not just old, not just boxes and tools, but old boxes and jumbles of tools, and found a bicycle pump and screwed not just the hose, but the end of the hose, not just into the tire, but to the valve stem of the tire, and began to pump. You see the, the additive detail of this instrumental use of language to create a very vivid, realistic picture. The air leaked out around the rim, but he turned the wheel and had the boy hold down the tire until it caught and he got it pumped up. He unscrewed the hose and turned the wheelbarrow over and trundled it, uh, trundles it across the floor and back. Then he pushed it outside for the rain to clean. There's a typical exemplary passage in the novel which has a total clarity of detail commitment to a vision of language as an instrument for depicting reality, which in a longer version of this I could talk about was precisely Hobbes's theory of language. That language was there to be an instrument, to be a method for rationally describing the scientific manner of the world so you could control and manipulate it. So it's a kind of Hobbesian realism that we have. But what I want to suggest to you is that while that dimension is very powerful in the world, a Hobbesian realism and commitment to utility and usefulness, there's also something else. And this something else is what comes from the alternative tradition, the other end of the spectrum, the Adam Smith dimension. And again, it has to do with this solitariness or the sociability, which really captures what an individual is. Smith, I remind you, we looked at this passage briefly, wrote, were it possible that a human creature could grow up in manhood in some solitary place without any communications and species, he could no more think of his own character than of the beauty or deformity of his own face. All these are objects which he cannot easily see, which naturally he does not look at, and with regard to it, <coughs> no mirror which can present them to his view. Bring him into society, and he's immediately provided with the mirror which he lacked before, which he wanted before. It's placed in the countenance and behavior 
of those he lives with. So Smith, in other words, in more contemporary parlance, believes that intersubjectivity is key to the human individual's self-recognition. And in The Road, this idea of intersubjectivity is present throughout in the fact that there's communication in the novel, particularly embodied in the communications between the boy and his father. And these communicative acts go beyond simply the useful and realistic namings of objects. Language in McCarthy's practice is much more than simply the correct naming of things. And that's what I want to try and uh, talk about a little bit more. In fact, and we'll go back to the novel in a little bit, but this is just a framework for that going back, which we'll do in a moment. In fact, what a lot of the novel does, as well as giving these vividly realistic descriptions of objects of the catastrophic world, is it plays a great deal of attention to what uh, Bernard Malinowski, an anthropologist writing in the 1920s, described as one of the most peculiar and specific features of human language, which he came to call phatic communication. Communication which doesn't deal with facts, but with phatic things, if I may venture a kind of pun. We have to recognize, he writes, that language originally was never used simply as a mirror for reflecting thought or a mirror of reflective thought. The manner in which I'm using it now in writing these words is actually very far-fetched. And in fact, it's a derivative function of language. Communication of facts is not the primary feature of language, but a derivative function of language. Because in this, language becomes a condensed piece of reflection, a record of fact or thought. Really, he argues, in its primitive uses, primitive meaning original here, language functions as a link in concerted human activity, <coughs> actually as a piece of human behavior. Really, it's a mode of action and not an instrument of reflection. Now, what I've been trying to show you in the first part of the, the lecture is that in McCarthy's writing in the road and elsewhere, a lot of it is used as an instrument for describing the real in a scientific, objective, factual sort of way, privileging that uh, what often appears as a primary use of language, but which Malinowski and others say is actually a secondary feature of language. Let me continue to try and explain that a little bit more. In discussing the function of speech in mere sociabilities, Adam Smith's term as well, we come to one of the bedrock aspects of man's nature and society. There is in all human beings the well-known tendency to congregate, to be together, to enjoy each other's company. Another man's silence is not a reassuring factor, but something alarming and dangerous. The breaking of silence, the communion of words, is the first act to establish links of fellowship. And we see this act again and again in the road. And Malinowski, in 
in writing about this was in the 1920s, writing in a period in which a vision of language as essentially nominalistic or realistic as there for scientific communication was being very powerfully pushed forward. And he was reacting against that. Interestingly enough, at the very moment of the formation of literary studies themselves, which were also trying to bring out this non-scientific, non-realistic use of language. And he got very excited with his invention of this new slightly awkward phrase of thetic communication. There can be no doubt that what we have here is a new type of linguistic use, thetic communication, I'm tempted to call it. It's a type of speech in which ties of union between people are created by a mere exchange of words. Are words in thetic communication used primarily to convey meaning? Certainly not. They fulfill a social function, and that is their primary or principal aim. And here's a, a good example of that book. It is only an example, and the book is built around these just as much as it's built around passages which depict the catastrophic world, the grey world of ash, the dark world, everything that's being grown. He watched the boy, and he looked out through the trees toward the road. This was not a safe place. OK, so that's, that's the Hobbesian element. This is not a safe place. Uh, the trees, we know, are almost limbless. There are no leaves there, standing ash almost. They could be seen from the road now. It was day. So a very frightening Hobbesian situation. The boy turned in the blankets. Then he opened his, his eyes. Hi, Papa, he said. I'm right here. I know. And there is this other use of language. It's not to give really any information. I mean, that's what it says. I'm right here. I know. Well, of course he knows. But those words are not being used to say, oh, look, in case you don't realize it, I'm here. You know, it'd be like a rather odd thing to say, wouldn't it? Because, well, you, you know I'm here. But the language here is not being used as it is in most of the narrative passages simply to describe the world, but to do something between people. To say, I'm here, and to actually transform reality. Let me try and explain what I mean by that transformation of reality. They'd have no food and little sleep for five days now. And in this condition, on the outskirts of a small town, they came upon a once grand house sighted on the rise above the road. The windows were oddly intact. What is this place, Papa? Shh. Let's just stand here and listen. There was nothing the wind rustling the dead roadside bracken, the distant creaking door or shutter. I think we should take a look. Papa, let's not go up there. It's OK. I don't think we should go up there. It's OK. We have to take a look. Now there. There's a phrase which is repeated over and over in the book. It's a simple phrase, and one I'm sure you've heard before. But you may not have ever asked what it means. It's the phrase, it's OK. 
and again, it's one of those everyday phrases which on analysis become extremely complicated. Because in this instance, when the father says to the boy, it's okay, it isn't using language in that realistic, depictive, instrumental way, which the novel uses most of the time. Because it isn't okay. Or he doesn't know whether it's okay or not. These are words of comfort and consolation, not of realistic depiction. It's a kind of extension of Malinowski's phatic communication, which brings people together in actually, <coughs> excuse me, in actually an impossible situation. And you, as you read the book, you'll see it's okay. It's said many, many, many times. And what this shows you is, in a sense, the magic of language. But language can do much more than mirror the world, reflected scientifically, objectively. It can create a world which makes you feel secure, or somewhat secure, even when it's not. In other words, it may be a Hobbesian world, but every moment, moment by moment, the two main characters <coughs> are creating a Smithian world of togetherness. And this comes through in another item of vocabulary, which those amongst you who have been alert and taking notes will be able to answer my next question. How many times in the quotations from the road that we've looked at have we seen the phrase, the road? Mm. Mm. Just run them through in your head and count them. I'm not really expecting that. <laughs> mm. yeah. but, but, but quite a lot. Now, on the one hand, I mean, it's the title of the book I said yesterday, that titles are really important. So. And my question in the exam would be, what does the road refer to? Okay. Now, on the one hand, you might give like a Hobbesian scientific, realistic definition. Well, the road refers to the road, the road that they're following. But actually, they don't follow the road. There isn't a single literal, nominative road, now meaning a road that they follow. The road is figurative. It's the combination of all the pathways, and not just the pathways, the pavements, the actual roads that they follow. It's every step they take is the road of the road, the novel. The road is an emotional thing. It's not literal. Uh, and that shows some of this creative power of language, which actually makes it bearable to read the book. Because just as the father keeps telling the boy it's OK, through the purely communicative gesture of saying it's OK, so somehow does the novel, The Road, tell you, the reader, it's OK, despite the fact of the catastrophic world it describes, in part because a relationship is formed of comfort between the boy and his father. And, you know, 
I started off by saying, well, on the surface at least, McCarthy is very Hobbesian. His books are very violent. They're about fear in society. They're gory, they're bloody. The Road is an absolutely devastating book which exemplifies the world as Hobbes feared it could be. But then McCarthy, like Frank Herbert, like Philip K. Dick, it's very similar to them. You know, he, he goes to school a bit, he goes to university, he drops out, he goes back to university, he drops out, he reads a lot of stuff, he's, he's like one of these self-taught geniuses that many writers are, kind of undisciplined, but disciplined in a different way. I've been struck in preparing these lectures on these similarities which I hadn't found before between the different authors we've been looking at. So McCarthy is actually very interested in science, in the science of the brain, in language, in questions of the unconscious. And there's an interesting essay or discussion that he has in the Santa Fe Institute of Complex uh, complex understanding. And, and here you get this other side to the Hobbesian also coming through. And it comes to realize, at some point, he, he says, the mind must grammaticize facts and convert them to narratives. The facts of the world do not, for the most part, come in narrative form. We have to do that. So there's something beyond nomination, which is the creativity of the narrative and the emotional bonds it can form between writer and reader. What are we saying here? Yes. That some unknown thinker sat up one night in his cave a million years ago and said, wow, one thing can be another thing, which he's identifying here as the essence of language, that, that language or symbols can stand in for something else. But then, like I've tried to show, this can have two sides to it. It can literally stand in, in a nominative way, but that never only works just like that. As well as the nominative, there's going to be a figurative sense potentially there, or a narrative sense, if you see what I mean. Yes, of course, that is what we're saying. Except, of course, that this unknown thinker, he didn't say that because there's no language for him to say it. <coughs> for the time being, he had to settle for just thinking it. The simple understanding that one thing can be another thing is at the root of all things of our doing. From using colored pebbles, from the trading of goats, to art and language, and on using symbolic marks to represent pieces of the world too small to see. Very interested in mathematics and astronomy and all sorts of other things. So, in the end, what rescues the road into some early cave, perhaps the earliest expressions of thinking language, you know, that's what moves McCarthy from being purely a Hobson to entering the domain of Smith where language is not just a scientific instrument, but a means not only of communication, but of socializing and bonding between people, which even in a catastrophic world can offer comfort and the grounds for potentially changing the situation. So it's One of my favorite philosophers is a Canadian philosopher, 
uh, man called Charles Taylor, whose uh, life work was mainly focused on the great German thinker, uh, Hegel. And Taylor is the author of a mammoth study of, of Hegel. He also wrote a, a lengthy book called Problems of the Sun, not Problems of the Sun, something of the Sun, I forget the title for now. And one of the things that I found really useful and interesting in his work is he talks a lot about the difference between these two ideas of language. Language purely as an instrument, a scientific instrument for describing the world. And this is